to those of you joining us, I'm just giving everybody a minute to get logged in and making sure all the technical features are working. So just gonna hang here for just a moment. All right, I show it's one o'clock and I think everything is working. So for those of you who don't know me yet, I am Dr. Christy Mulkey and I'm the workshop coordinator with 240 Tutoring. And this summer we've been doing a lot of online workshops and we've done those kind of in a general sense and put those on our main Facebook page and our YouTube channel and our Instagram page. But we've had some requests for state specific, subject specific videos to help target some things that people really need. And so that is the goal of these live videos in our Facebook group. So we're gonna do these every Tuesday. Um, so one o'clock here in the Praxis group, um, we'll do a video and I'll take your feedback and we will use that to drive that video content. But we'll work through some standards and practice questions to best help you prepare for your exam. I'm gonna be monitoring comments. I've got about four devices going here. Um, assuming all the technology continues to work, I'm gonna monitor comments. So if you have a question or a comment, just drop it in there. I'll check as we go. But today, we are going to look at the math subtest, test 5003 for Praxis Elementary Ed. And we're gonna look at topic one. So we're gonna start with that. And I'm gonna share my screen with you so that you can easily follow along. Now we'll warn you this morning, I had some technical glitches. Hopefully everything works fine this afternoon. So, it appears to be working. All right, so yay, all the technology appears to continue to work. So again, today we're looking at the math subtest for elementary education, and we're gonna be looking at topic one. Now the way these videos are structured is, again, we're trying to be specific to your state and your test, and math is one of the ones that's most commonly asked for support. We're gonna do some explanations of the standards and competencies, and then we're gonna work through some practice questions together where I can teach you some strategies, some skills, and provide some explanation for you as we go. So let's jump right in. Here, we're looking at the first standard, numbers and operations, and we're looking at all the components. Now, what's nice about Praxis for this elementary ed exam is they really explain to you what those standards mean. So we can break that down into 1A, understands the place value system. 1B, understands operations and properties of rational numbers. 1C, understands proportional relationships and percents. D, knows how to use basic concepts of number theory. And E, knows a variety of strategies to determine the reasonableness of results. Now, I've heard some students say, this is just too overwhelming. It's too much to look at. But what's nice about this is if we just had number and operations, and that's all they gave us, that wouldn't be very helpful. Even if we just had these items, the big things, see my pen has not been super cooperative today, and I can tell it's going to continue to not be. So I'm going to try to work this as best I can. We have these little breakdowns. Even if we had those, we'd still be questioning what all is involved. So I really like what they've done with the standards here is you can see exactly what you need to know to be prepared under this topic, okay? So we're gonna jump in and we're gonna look at some problems. What I would recommend you do before you work any problems is you just read through these. And if there's any word in there you don't know, look that word up, okay? Look at our flashcards if you're using 240 tutoring, you may find it there. But know the words 
in these standards because you're going to see them come up in the questions. All right, now we're going to look at this first question. All these questions came from the free public practice questions that are on in the Praxis Study Companion. So if you go to the Praxis website and look at that elementary ed math subtest, these questions came right from there. Now you're probably thinking, well, why are we doing questions that I have on the internet? Okay, so these questions are out there and you can work them and you can see the right answer. And what's nice about Praxis is they give you an explanation. What's not so friendly about that explanation is the way it's worded. Those explanations are worded for math majors or people who really have a solid understanding of advanced mathematics. And so I've been a math teacher for 20 years. I looked at some of those explanations. I was like, oh, that's difficult to follow. So I'm going to try to break that down in a more user friendly way for you so that you can see those explanations in terms that should make sense to the average person, not a mathematician. Okay, so this first question is on properties of rational numbers. And so it says, which of the following is an example of the commutative property? Now I'm gonna to attempt to write on here. Let's see if it will give me that control. Yeah, it's working. I'm gonna to try to change the color and see if it helps a little bit. Here is one of those terms that's actually in those standards we talked about. So if you read through those, like I said just a second ago, and saw commutative property and you didn't know what that was, that would be something you would need to look up. Now I'm gonna give you a brief explanation. Commutative just means we can move the numbers around and it doesn't change the value or the answer. And so a commutative property of addition means we can take the add-ins, move them around, the order doesn't matter, and the sum will stay the same. Now, of course, there's a more technical mathematical definition of that. and You can look that up. Here's just the everyday explanation. Now, the key word also in here is addition. So th they made this actually fairly easy for you. Since we're looking for property of addition, we can actually rule out two of these that have multiplication in them. We can just take those out. Fairly easy so far. Now, when we're looking at an addition problem and you have a number plus a number equals another number, these two are called your add-ins and this one is called your sum. So when we're looking at the commutative property, we can rearrange those add-ins and still get the same sum. So if you're looking at this, you're probably thinking, um, well B, those numbers are just rearranged and D, those numbers are just rearranged. Those could both be the answer. No, because if you're familiar with order of operations, PEMDAS, oops, I left out a letter. Let me just start that over. It's faster, just scribble it, then erase it. All right, so if we're looking at, you've probably heard this. You may be like, I don't remember what it is, but you've heard it. This is order of operations. You start with parentheses, then exponents, then multiplication and or division, then addition and or subtraction, all right? So if we look at B, we would have to work the parentheses first. So one plus seven would be eight, plus four would be 12. And then over here, seven plus four would be 11, plus one would be 12. And you're thinking, well, they equal the same thing. But if I rearrange those, I'm messing with the order of operations. So if I have one plus seven plus four, and I rearrange that to be one plus four plus seven, it changes how this works. So the simplest answer right here is eight plus nine, nine plus eight. All right, we can say eight plus nine is 17, nine plus eight is 17. Then we don't have to look at order of operations. So the simple answer in this case is the right answer. So that commutative property, when you add in parentheses, takes a different view because you can't just rearrange numbers and get the same solution. So if we move around all these parentheses, if you want to go back and play with it, you'll see what I mean, you'll get different solutions. 
okay? So that equal sign wouldn't work anymore. So in this case, simplest answer is the right answer. All right, let's look at another question. It says a fourth grade class started working on math worksheets at 1.30 p.m. and stopped working at 3.10 p.m. How long did the class work on math worksheets? This is a elapsed time, real world problem solving scenario. So when we're dealing with elapsed time, we're trying to figure out how much time passed between a starting point and an ending point. I don't actually like to use a clock. Now, some of you are very capable of doing this in your head, but I wanna show you a quick little strategy that you can write out and it will help you. I like to just use a simple, I'll make that line just a little bit longer, hopefully, table. Okay, and I'm gonna start with that start time and try to work towards my end time. And I'm always gonna to try to move to hour increments. So if I wanna get from 1.30 to two o'clock, that is going to be 30 minutes. All right, I'm still not to 3.10. So I wanna get from two o'clock and I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next hour increment, which would be three o'clock. That is 60 minutes or one hour. And then I'm at three o'clock and I need to get to 310 to get from there to there, 10 minutes. Now I can quickly add these up, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 minutes. The answer is C. So little table, starting time, ending time, work to hour increments and just see how many minutes it takes you to get there. You didn't even have to convert this 100 minutes into hours and minutes. So this one was pretty straightforward. All right, let's look at this one. Factors and multiples are what we're looking at here. So it says the only prime factors of a certain number are two, three, and seven. Which of the following could be the number? Now, the first thing you need to know is what is prime? And a prime number is a number where the only factors are one in itself. So when we look at a multiplication problem, kind of like that addition problem we were, looked at earlier, the numbers we're multiplying together are called the factors and the answer is called the product. Now we can take any whole number, for instance, let's take the number six, and we can determine its factors. So what numbers can I multiply together to give me six? Well, I could do two and three. You can't break down two anymore except to two and one. Two times one is two, that's it. Three times one is three, that's all you've got. So two and three are what would we call prime numbers. So the only factors they have are one in themselves. A good little strategy a lot of mathematicians will use is just try to memorize the most frequent small prime numbers. So if you can get those in your head, it makes it go a little bit faster when you encounter a problem like this. Now I showed this to my junior high age daughter and I was just curious how she would solve this because I was trying to figure out what might be some common errors or mistakes. And the first thing she did was try to find the products of all of these equations and then factor that. I was like, oh no, honey, that takes too long. Because if we multiply 18 and 28, we know two factors are 18 and 28. So I'm just going to take that 18 and 28 and factor those down. Because if I multiply them together, there's two factors. So we're gonna do just a little factor tree. So what times what would give me 18? I see six and three, you can do nine and two, it doesn't matter. And I'm gonna take six and I'm gonna break that down into two and three. So I have these prime numbers right here, broken down as far as I can go. And I'm gonna take 28 and I'm gonna break that down. I see seven times four. Seven is prime, it can't go any further. Four, I can take down to two and two. Now we don't have to repeat these. I don't wanna erase that because I don't want you to think those are negatives. I was just noting them. Um, we don't have to repeat these. When we list all the factors, we can say we have two, three, and seven. We don't have to say two, 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 three, three, seven. All right. So right there, that's what we're looking for. So I think the correct answer is A. We can go ahead and check all of these really quickly. I'm going to look at B, break down 20 and 21. 
for me, I see five and four, and then four breaks down into two and two. So all prime, we're good to go there. Here I see seven and three, easy enough. Now I could have said, as soon as I saw this five, this could not be the answer because it said the only prime factors are two, three, and seven. So that rules out B. We take answer choice C and we take 22 and 63. I'm gonna take that 22 and I see 11 and two. Well, those are prime and I see 11 in this list. I don't even have to break down 63. 11 is not one of the choices. So C also cannot be an option. Now I'm gonna look at D. We have 24 and 35. I'm gonna break down that 24. I see, you could look at this several ways. I see six times four. I can break that down to two and three, two and two. So right now that fits. Now I'm gonna take my 35 and I see seven and five. Well, so we have the two, the three and the seven, but because this five is listed here, D also cannot be the correct answer. So we were correct and the answer was A. So just some basic factoring here um, that should be pretty straightforward. Hopefully you remember what the word prime means and you remember what a factor is. All right, let's move on to the next one. Now here we're looking at percentages. And so figuring out how to do that, I'm gonna walk you through it. It's not difficult at all, especially since on this exam, you can use a calculator. So I've got a little calculator in front of me, just a basic four function calculator. Um, but let's work through this problem. Riding on a school bus are 20 students in ninth grade, 10 students in 10th grade, nine students in 11th grade, and seven students in 12th grade. Approximately what percentage it percentage of the students on the bus are in ninth grade. So total, we're going to need, anytime you have a percentage, you have a portion of a total, a portion of a total. So we've got to figure out the total first. So I'm going to take all those numbers. I have 20, 10, 9, and 7. When you add all of those up, you're going to get 46. You could do that on a calculator. You could do it by pencil. To me, they're about the same for this basic math. And then we can set this up. 46 is our total. And it's asking us what percentage were in the ninth grade. It said here, 20 students were in the ninth grade. This is very straightforward. And we can divide that out. 20, he noticed, what did I do? I went to the calculator for the basic math. 46, 20 divided by, that line stands for division, equals 0 0.4347, dot, 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 dot. All right, since it said approximately, we can just round that, 0 0.43, and to change that into a percentage, we move that decimal, two places to the right and it becomes 43 percent so the correct answer here is b the trick to remember about a percentage portion divided by total that's how you find a percentage the portion we're trying to determine divided by the total so straight up pretty easy there makes it go really quickly with a calculator All right now this one a little bit longer says, after a lesson on rounding and estimation, a teacher tells students that 157 rulers will be distributed to four teachers. The teacher asks the students to estimate the number of rulers each teacher will receive if the rulers are shared equally, as equally as possible among the teachers. Which of the following students pr produces the best estimate for the number of rulers each teacher will receive? So we have a box of 157 rulers and we're gonna distribute those out as equally as possible to four teachers. So you should see that distribution implies division. So we're really looking at 157 divided by four, but it was asking for the best 
estimate so I can round. Now I'm gonna look for the closest compatible number that's evenly divisible by four. So if you know your fours facts, or you can skip count by four, four, eight, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28. If you can do that, you can quickly see, I can round this 157 to 160 and I get a nice easy mental math problem. Because if I know 16 divided by four is four, 160 divided by four would be 40. You can just add that zero on the end. So that estimation, the student who said about 40 has the best estimate. Now, a common thing might be to round 157 to 200 and divide that by four, which in this case, you would get 50, and that's not an answer choice. Plus, that's not the best estimate because 200 is really a long ways from 157. So I'm gonna look for the closest compatible number there. Some people might say, I'm gonna take that 157 down to 120 and divide that by four, and then I get 30. Now that answer's there, but the best estimate is to take that 157 right to 160, the closest compatible number, okay? So this one should be a quick one you can do in your head if you know your basic facts. All right, now we did some practice problems. Let's talk about some other ways to prepare. It is key because you're taking an online or on the computer test that you know the test format. The first thing I want you to be sure you know is the total number of questions and about how many you need to get correct. I usually tell students to have like a little running chart. If you watched my video about a month ago on strategies for test taking, I say you can do a check, a question mark, and an X. And I just tell students, as you come across problems, number one, I'm confident I got that right. Number two, I'm confident. Number three, I have no idea. Blind guess, terrible. Number four, questionable. I got it narrowed down, but I'm not confident in my answer. So then at the end, you can kind of quickly see how many of these do I really need to go back and look at that I had a question mark by. Am I close to that mark? You also need to know the style of questions. Are they all multiple choice? Are they all mostly problem solving? How many require a calculator? The only way to get good at that is to practice. You need to know your time limit. And what I like to suggest is take the time limit and divide it in half and tell yourself, if there are 40 questions and I have an hour, I need to have 20 questions done in 30 minutes. So. I just picked round easy numbers to work with there, guys. So take that time limit, divide it in half, and that's kind of your marker of I need to be halfway done at that halfway point. Some people break it down into smaller groups, and of course you can do that. Know what the setup looks like. What does the screen look like? So that day when you're in there taking that test, you're not trying to figure out where do I click, what do I do? What's nice is there are lots of practice materials on the Praxis website. Go take a look at those. There is an on-screen calculator, and I love what Praxis has done, is you can actually get on there and request some practice with that calculator. Now you have to provide your email address, but you can get online and actually practice with that on-screen calculator so that you know what to do and you don't waste time during the test trying to figure that out. And the last thing I wanted to encourage you is consider your pacing. I taught college for many, many, many years, and I had so many college students who would leave an exam and call me back and tell me, oh, I didn't finish. I didn't finish. I looked up. I had two minutes left and 15 questions. Pacing is critical because then you're just random guessing at 15, and students will say, oh, I didn't realize I took 10 minutes on one problem. Well, now you're forced to guess at 15 at the end because you spent 10 minutes on one problem. So consider your pacing. And the only way to really get that down is to practice, is to practice. Here, you can see what I was talking about. If you go on the ETS website, you can just Google it. You can see where you can click, you can put in your email address, and you can actually get practice with that calculator. It looks a lot like this calculator. So if you happen to have access 
to this calculator at home or at school or a child has one, borrow one, you can practice on this calculator because it will look the same. But I would highly recommend you try the on screen. That's a little more cumbersome to work with. So I highly suggest you take a look at that online practice with the on screen calculator. It's going to save you a lot of time. All right. Final thoughts. You can get more information in our study guides. If you're not a user of 242 tutoring, I highly recommend you go check us out. All of these videos will be saved right here in our Facebook group. So this will be saved. If you didn't get to watch this live, you can watch this later. We're also recording them and we are putting them on our YouTube channel. So you can go to our YouTube channel and look for the Praxis playlist. That's where it will be housed. You'll see a recording of this video. So you can watch it at any time. If you prefer to look through YouTube, it'll be there. We highly encourage you to go look at our free resources. We have ultimate guides, which will tell you what to anticipate on the test. So if you're not confident, well, how many questions are there? What does that look like? You can go check all that out in our ultimate guide. And of course, if you need more study materials, our study guides are guaranteed. So again, I'm Dr. Christy Mulkey. I don't see any questions in the comments, so I'm going to sign out, but I will be back next Tuesday with more practice. If you have something you would like us to do a video on, video on, please drop that in the comments. Even if you're watching this later, we'll take that into consideration and I will see you next week for a video. Tomorrow, I'll be active in this group. I'll start a discussion thread where I can answer questions. I'll be going through posts and trying to answer as many questions as possible. We're calling it live office hours. So if you want access to me tomorrow, go check out our time. We posted all those times and images in this Facebook group. So if you're unsure of those, go check those out. But I hope to see you soon. Again, I'm Dr. Christy Mulkey with 240 Tutoring. Thank you.